welcome to my channel, Whiskey and Wool. This is my Knitter's Life series, season three, episode five. Um, I start each season at the beginning of the year and I film about every two weeks. This year has been a little uneven for me because I am moving. Um, so I kind of turned the angle of the camera a bit because the bed that's normally right over here in this corner is gone. There's just the mattress you can see up against the wall, which will be leaving shortly as well. Um, I'm going to be donating it to a, um, a veterans society organization that's around here. Um, where I live and work in northern New Jersey. I live just outside of New York City. Um, it's about 45 minutes on a good day with no traffic from where I live right now, but I'm going to be moving to a town that is right next to the river, the Hudson River, and has New York City views. Um, very excited about that, and I hope yeah, let me tell, just give you a quick brief update because the last time in my episode two weeks ago, I did not know if this place was gonna fall through. What happened is that the building didn't pass the muster for the mortgage company that I was working with. Um, so there was some some work that the, the latest inspection showed it should have happened, but it hadn't happened yet. So the broker, the lending company pulled out and the broker didn't have any anywhere else to turn to. So um, I had to switch brokers, so that is what happened. And I'm working with another broker who was apprised of this situation with the building and did not think it was a big deal. I don't know what, I do not know what exactly the building needs to do or what exactly they are doing. I do know that they changed management companies um, and that was in the works around the time I put my offer down back in January. <laughs> so they now have a new management company, could be part of what the problem was, there may have been some mismanagement and hopefully it's under control and um, yeah. So that's where I'm at, I'm still waiting, there's no guarantee yet, um, it's not a done deal, but they are this um, lending company is moving forward with, they've approved me. Um, my stuff is fine. It's the now getting the building, um, to cooperate and all of that. And, um, so far so good. Everything looks pretty good. Um, uh, we've, we've moved a step beyond where we were before, um, with the last company. I don't know. My closing date got moved and I'm now, uh, it was the end of March. Now it's been moved to the middle of April. We'll see what happens. Um, I'm told that it could move out again if the mortgage isn't settled by the end of next week. Um, to be continued. Hopefully I don't have to start over. There's still a chance. I may have to start all over again, but on the upside, I did look at inventory in the same area and it's pretty good because now it's spring, you know, when I was first looking, it was January. Now it's March. Spring is coming. It's here. It's on its way. It'd be here in another week, I guess, officially. What's the first day of spring? March 21st? Oh, it'll, it's, today's the 18th. Today's my cat's birthday. I'll try to get some footage from him. I don't have any footage of him yet, but I'll try to get some before I do too much editing. To just show you the birthday boy. He is nine. He is so cute. He's um, he brings me a lot of joy. Um, yeah, he's a good guy. He's he's an easy going, easy guy to hang out with. So having a little water. So that is life update a little bit anyway. Oh, I have a clip. I'm gonna show you this clip before I go get into my regular. Ch uh, channel stuff. Um, this clip is about, I did some cleanup. Well, let me just let the clip speak for itself. And if I need to fill in after I will or during. Um. So in my town, we do bulk day pickup where the town will pick up everything that you leave out except books and paint cans and other like 
turpentine and stuff like that. They won't take that. They won't take any building materials. Um, but they'll take clothes and they'll give them to a donate, you know, donate them. They'll take all odds and ends and things like, like that. Um, and yeah, so this is the pile of stuff that I'm taking out. This, this is, I didn't show you videos of the stuff that went out before, but this is the third time I'm doing a batch. I think I'm nearing the end. Uh, it's mostly clothes that don't fit me anymore, or I don't wear a lot, or linens that are worn out and just need to be, you know, recycled and such. And then some other random weird stuff that I've had around, hanging around. Um, so yeah, it's been, it's been a trip and I, yeah, this is almost the end. I suspect I will have one or two, maybe three bags moving forward into the next one. But I wanted to also share something else with you. I spent some time this week organizing old photos. So I have three of these bins here full of old photos from going well, way back to my very young childhood. I don't have too many of these. My mother had most of them and I just got a handful. Um, so those are all in here. And then um, this is a fun one from our from the 80s. Um, I'm on the far left right there. It's my family of origin. Um, my sisters and my mom and stepfather. Um, but yeah, uh, going all the way back to 2005, I, I set up, I got these um, handy containers, these stackable containers that are also on wheels um, from the container store. So those will go on a shelf in my new place where I'll be able to pull them out if I care to look at them. The only bad thing I can say is that there there's no lid. Um, what, whatever, I think it's okay. But um, the, all of these photos and then more that are stacked that I've already packed. There's a couple photo boxes like traditional style. Not this. This is a document box, but there's photo boxes down at the bottom um, that I had kept a lot of the images from my kids' childhood there. But all of that and this box here, which is all photo albums, and were all in this bin and it was just too heavy for me to manage. And this bin is like just too big to really store easily. So um, it's more for like garage storage and I won't have that anymore. So I just resorted things. And this um, smaller box right here is all of the really big pictures like the eight by tens and the five by eights and all of that. And then some other precious documents like you know, diplomas and <laughs> little keepsakes, things that my kids made when they were young, things like that. I also found in looking all of these old letters from my childhood, um, like from my teenage through college and a little bit beyond college years that I need to sort through. Um, but I found some pretty precious things like this is a letter from my father telling me about his own childhood and that was really emotional for me to read um but yeah that's a picture I mean a letter that I want to keep and I need to sort through and suss out the you know the meaningless from the meaningful so it could take me a little while um here to do that um but yeah pretty pretty fun but emotional process. Um, but one of the things that I wanted to just share with you about the photos, like the process of going through those photos and looking at my entire adult life up to 2005 or 2006, which was when I stopped um, getting physical photos and started to just use digital. It was really interesting. Like it was a very validating process. It was highly emotional, of course, but it was also like a very validating process to understand like who I am and where I came from and what I've been doing like what have I been doing these past like 40 years of my life of my adult life um, I was also really surprised how much knitting really focused uh, or really you know how often I was wearing a garment that I knew I hand knit that I remembered knitting so I'll, I'll try to put some of those there I did see an image of my very first colorwork sweater which was my second sweater that I ever made <laughs> I was like 18 years old um, and I made this colorwork sweater um, from an old pattern that I had found in um, at a garage sale. 
I'll, if I can find it, I'll pop it in. I looked, I did a quick look through. It should have been here in these photos, but it wasn't. Um, yeah, I have a lot of really, really precious images. This is not a uh, hand knit at all, but this was, you know, an event. The first college wedding that me and my college boyfriend went to. It's a really fun picture. I cut it down, I think, to carry it around in my wallet. Yeah, so that was from 1987. <laughs> Pretty cool, though, to see the styles and stuff. Um, then, of course, he looks you know, he, you could take him out and put him, walk him on the street of Wall Street and he would look fine. But me, I would look totally out of place with that hairstyle. Um, yeah, so that, that's been fun. That's been, that took a lot of time, just like going through the photos, reorganizing them. I didn't do a perfect job, but um, I did, I think I did okay. Um, there were a couple other fun photos like I can't even believe this is me like I had, to, had a double take like oh my god is that me um that I went through a phase where I was doing I was in art school at this point and so I just kind of you know because I was focused on my studies I didn't really pay too much attention to my hair I just let it grow I don't think I went to a stylist for a while and just let it grow and yeah I was in a no makeup phase at that point in my life um it was interesting interesting process uh I I kind of want to say I recommend doing this too oh my gosh too I found my high school diploma <laughs> I went to California. I went to high school in California. So Simi Valley is a town in California. I thought that was kind of fun and a surprising find. Um, but yeah, it was, it was, it was cool. I, I'm glad I did it. I feel a lot better about myself. Um, I don't, I can't explain it. Like it was just a really, really meaningful experience for me to go through that. I don't know that I'll ever do it again, but it was really fun. <laughs> a really insightful I would say to who I am and how how I got to where I am today yeah I I yeah I went through my old stuff and found some treasures <laughs> Hope you enjoyed that that was really it was very very interesting like looking back at all those old photos of myself and seeing where I was and where I came and remembering all of those decisions I made and the things, you know, that happened and how I got to where I am right now, <laughs> like why I'm here and what I'm doing. And we really don't change all that much, but it was just, it was pretty, you know, we're, I don't think I've ever really experienced that type of perspective where you just sort of take a step back and go see what's going on because you're so in it, you know, like you're in it and you don't really, you're not really you're not really, you know, you don't really have the the vantage point of perspective on decisions you're making um, and things that you're doing and or things that you're trying to do because um, you're just like in it, if that makes sense. I hope that makes sense. Anyway, I have many finished objects to share with you. I do not have Martha here because she there's nothing for her to wear. <laughs> Because I finished everything from my last episode. Um, so let's get into uh, content. We're going to start with whiskey content. I have a little bit of uh, whiskey chat, um, which I'll have you watch now. And if you are not interested in seeing the whiskey chat, if they run about 10 minutes. I'll tell you where to skip to. Hi, we're going to do a little whiskey chat. Um, it is St. Patty's Day, so I'm wearing my green sweater. It's been so lovely wearing it the last couple weeks. Um, yeah, so in honor of St. Patty's Day, I thought we'd do an Irish whiskey. I actually had two in my stash, my whiskey stash, um, from my whiskey advent. Um, so the one I'm going to taste today is Glen Garif series bog oak charred cask single malt irish whiskey and it is 43 percent alcohol um i've 
I realized in doing a little looking at where this whiskey is made that I've actually done a review of another whiskey that this um, distillery made. This particular whiskey is made by West Cork Distillers. They were established in 2003. And they say that they are the largest Irish-owned um, whiskey distillery in Ireland. Um, and obviously they're located in West Cork, uh, Ireland, in the countryside. Um, it was founded by three childhood friends, um, John O'Connell, Jer McCarthy, and Dennis McCarthy. Um, and in 2003, it didn't really make any economic sense to open a distillery, but they decided to go ahead and do so anyway. Um, and yeah, they, they, um, they're in, oh, they're in Skibberdine. Yes, I remember Skibberdine. I think there's a garden there or something, but anyway, I'll put on some pictures on screen of the region. Um, so you get a chance to take a look at it. It seems to be pretty accessible and it's not expensive. It's about a $35 bottle. Uh, yeah, I hope it's good because that's a good price for whiskey. Um, I don't know. There's not a whole lot more on there. They said that they did want to make Irish whiskey accessible and um, they're continuing to grow and um, they are... Yeah, they have. They are a big employer down in the West Cork region, and they are also award-winning, making some of the best Irish whiskeys available worldwide. Um, they do make several. Oh, you know, I did a gin from them. They do Garish Island gin, which I reviewed. I think this past summer or or early fall. Um, they also do. Two Trees Vodka and Two Trees Gin and yeah and then this West Cork Irish Whiskey which they do different bottlings and different series some are more specialized um, this one in particular is pretty specialized I'm going to actually click on their their um, Irish Whiskey just to see what they have Okay, so they have a bourbon cask Irish whiskey, a black cask Irish whiskey, and a five-year single pot still Irish whiskey. Um, they make a the, this bog charred bog oak charred cask. Um, they have what they call a peat charred cask, an IPA cask, uh, a rum cask. They have a ton, a ton of whiskeys. I'm gonna try to get a picture of the lineup to show you um but yeah they have a ton i didn't finish even reading them all because it will, will I'll, I'll be here for a while if i try to do that um but yeah so this particular whiskey the way that it is aged it is first aged in s x sherry casks for four years and then it spends the last six to nine months in charred bog oak casks they make their own casks so some you'll find that some whiskey distillers especially um ones that are want to control more aspects of the production of whiskey will have their uh, a cooperage on site so they have a cooperage they make their own whiskey barrels so they decided to try making some out of bog oak and then they charred them charred the inside of them of those bog oaks um, and what they say about their bog oaked charred cask whiskey is that um, the inspiration comes from the ancient hills of Glengariff, West Cork, Cork, which is home to the ancient woodlands and accompanying bogland. The Glengariff series of West Cork Irish whiskey is an August tribute to the historic part of Ireland. Bog oak from Glengariff is burned using traditional bellowing techniques to char the casks and create a truly unique Irish whiskey. So we would expect a little bit of smokiness from that charring. Um, the sherry will give it some fruity flavors, um, presumably. 
And oak usually, like if it's American oak barrels, X, you know, bourbon barrels or something like that, we would usually get kind of these cakey flavors. So I'm curious to try this and see what it what it is like. It's certainly intriguing. Okay, I smell a lot of sweetness on the nose. It almost smells like bourbon. There's a little bit of smokiness. And definitely a little spice in that in that on the nose smell. Oh, so it smells so enticing. Oh, interesting. Definitely sharper, not as fruity as I expected. I thought I would get some real fruity flavors. Not as fruity as I expected. More, there's a sharpness in there, like a tart fruit flavor. Hmm. And definitely spice. And there's a little bit of that like creaminess that you usually get from oak. Mmm, that's really, really good. I know I know I'm not really describing it well. Some days I'm out of fail. I f words fail me. <laughs> wow, it's really good. I taste this, the oak pretty strongly. A little bit of smokiness. Not as smoky as I expected. I think that's probably just my own thoughts. That like, oh, it's charred, so therefore there's going to be smoke. Um, all right. So let's see what they say about it. And then we'll check out what another um, independent reviewer says about it. Okay, uh, aroma, spice, dried leather with a sweet dried fruit undertone and taste, intense spice, malt and cracked pepper. Interesting, I don't know if I would have described it that way kind of hoping for a little bit more info but I don't see it okay let's see what an independent reviewer says usually they're different all right um on the nose apples pears dried apricot cocoa malt spice and a little bit oily char and bismuth the palate is spicy fruit juice such as peach, pear, apricot, and apricot cider. It also tastes of malt, cocoa, toffee, and some oak with bits of that oily char. I didn't think about char, the char being oily, but... It's accurate. Mmm. It's good. Definitely. That's the sharpness I'm tasting, then, that oiliness. The finish is toffee, malt, cocoa, oak, fruit, and a whiff of smoke. Um, and overall, they say a great sense of balance, round body with an oily feel. Cool. Very interesting. Um, I love to do unique uh, tastings just because it's, you know, and it's nice to get just a little taste so then I know whether or not I want to buy a whole bottle but of course there's always another whiskey to taste so I don't have a lot of big bottles but it's okay I have enough um for these days but anyway happy St. Pat's hope you enjoyed that um like last time I really haven't been drinking very much at all just have been feeling more of the need. I think I always, I think I view alcohol. I know I view alcohol as a, as something as a social, I'm a social drinker, but I'm also like kind of a good times drinker. You know, like I like to drink in good times when I'm stressed. I don't, I don't eat or drink. <laughs> I just don't. Yeah. It's like, well, you know, put it in front of me. I'll eat it. Otherwise I'm not going to think about it. Um, so there's that. Anyway, let's talk about knits. You're not here to hear about that stuff. Um, I finished my Stockholm V-neck, Stockholm slipover V-neck, Stockholm V-neck slipover. I think it's Stockholm slipover V-neck by Petite Knit. Um, and I knit it from these two yarns held 
double. So this uh, silk merino single ply from the Enchanted Kettle. This is, was a one of a kind that I bought many years ago. My oldest indie dyed stash, I'd say. Really happy to use it up. Um, and I paired it with this mohair silk from Chelsea Lux, also one of a kind, something that I got um, at a clearance sale or something that, that she was having a couple years back. So it was really nice to get these out of my stash. Um, I had three skeins of each. These are what are left of the second skeins. Uh, so one, one skein of mohair just went into my mohair pile and it'll get knit into something else down the road. So, so yeah, what can I say about it? I, um, I have a big, I have a full bust. So I have a big, uh, chest measurement compared to the rest of my body. And I, um, I was concerned about the shoulders of the vest not lining up with my shoulders. And I actually still feel like it's a little bit wide up here. I knit the size medium from till until about here. And then I went up two more sizes to accommodate the, my fuller bust. And I still think, I think I could have even done the small, um, which I find pretty interesting because I, would not consider myself a small person. Like I'm not a small, like I don't know if I've ever bought size small for myself, like maybe as a preteen, but anyway. Um, yeah, so it's a little, I still feels a little bit broad to me. Um, but you know, that strategy definitely worked. I ended up with a lot of ease here and um, you know, a little bit narrower shoulder here because I think it probably would have ended over here which really would have driven me nuts. It just would have made it look like it's I'm wearing you know something two sizes too big. But I really do like the fit of it otherwise. Um, I talked about knitting it last time uh, about alternating skeins so I use two skeins of both mohair and the silk and um, or the single the wool silk blend and um, I alternated skeins throughout because I was a little nervous about some color because it is indie dyed. Um, the sweater also grew quite a bit when I blocked it. So I, um, I ended up with a longer vest than I thought I was going to, which is I'm fine with. It still looks fine. I'll put a picture on screen of me wearing it so you can see. How, um, and I styled it with this cute white um, sort of sheer blouse with a little ruffle neck. I just really love it. I think it looks so cute um, together. Yeah. Anyway, always, whenever I sit down to film, I think I look crooked. <laughs> I always think this shoulder is lower than this shoulder. Uh -uh -uh. How's that? Perfect. <laughs> it must just be the way I move. I don't know. Um, okay. So I finished this. I also finished, I thought I brought it over. Yes, this, so a couple of the things that I finished are still damp. So I also finished the uh, latest Manhattan hat that I was making using um, Lamb and Kid Todd, which is a DK base, 65 cashmere, uh, 65 yak, sorry, 35 cashmere. And their Diamond Lane, Birdie, which is 74% alpaca, 26% silk. So I held two strands together. I, this is all I have left of the birdie. It's about half a skein. And I used up the entire skein of Todd that I had. This hat, if you want to make the triple fold version, you really need two skeins of the Todd. One skein of birdie would be fine. Um, and I actually ended up shortening this part because I was running out of yarn. Um, so I had knit a little bit and ripped back and then knit more. And I could see I was about five rows away from the top. And it, yeah, that's why it looks kind of square instead of more pointed because I had to do rapid increase or decreases right here on these two sides in order to um, make it work. But I, I tried it on before, I blocked it and it's still a little damp, so I don't wanna put it on right now, but I tried it on before 
I blocked it and it looked fine. So I'm, I'm not worried about it. And this is a single, no fold version. Maybe I can put it on real quick. Let's see. Let's see. There we go. <laughs> Actually, you could fold it. Oh my God, it is too big for me. This will not be for me. This will be for someone else. Um, I also have a little bit of a small head, so there we go. It's cute. I think that, I mean, I don't have it on straight, but you get the idea. I think that the decreases are fine. They're not perfect, but they, they work. So I'm going to let that continue drying over there. <laughs> I also finished the massive blanket I was making, the one by one rib holding 10 strands of yarn, a fingering weight yarn together and knitting on US 17 needles, really big US 17 needles. Uh, I was, I make, I made an Afghan or a throw rather for one of my sons. Um, I had made a black one first, a black and gray one. So this one is purplish, purple tones, purple and blue. It's really pretty. It is still damp and it is laying over there on the floor where the bed used to be. <laughs> it's really, it's, well, it's like, I would say it's the same as the other one. It's probably going to end up being 45 or 48 inches by 60 or so. Um, it's still damp. So I'm going to just put on some footage here of it laying there. So you get an idea of what it looked like. The idea was to, I cast on 65 stitches. So it's an improv, um, pattern. I didn't, I didn't purchase it or anything. It's sort of my go-to formula for throws um, that I, you know, both make for myself and give away. So yeah, it's cast on 65 stitches, holding 10 strands together in a one by one knit pattern and uh, just knit until I reached, you know, 65 inches. Although I will say this, if you are making one, I know a couple people have reached out to me and said, thank you for sharing this idea. I love it. Want to make one or, and so maybe you're already in the works with one. I can tell you that what you need to do to make sure you get the length is to lay it down and pull open the rib because it will shrink as you pull the rib open. Um, so, cause I knit that, I, I should have measured what it was closed just so I knew because I am making a third one. Um, but that that worked for me just by laying it down on on the floor pulling the rib open it would stay open if I had it on carpet and then measuring and then you know putting a, a stitch marker and just saying okay I know I need to knit like 20 more inches or I need to knit 10 more inches or 8 more inches to get there um, I do have a substantial amount of yarn left. This is what I have left from the yarns that I was working with. And I think I had mentioned last time that I had, um, I actually have a second bag here of some purples. Um, when I did the black one, I used up pretty much every last bit of black and gray <laughs> yarn that I had in my stash, which felt really good. Um, total yardage that you'll need for doing something like that to get it to this size is at least 6,000 yards. You probably need somewhere in that six, uh, six to 7,000, 7,000, you'll be fine. So it's a lot of skeins. <laughs> it's 16 or 17 skeins of, um, fingering weight. But you know, if you, if you knit a lot and you have a lot of scraps, that might be not a big reach really. For the black one, I started with I used 10 skeins, 10 full skeins, and then I used a whole bunch of scraps I had to make the difference. Um, I really thought maybe 10 full skeins would get me there, but it really, it didn't, it wasn't enough. And so for this one, I kind of mixed it up more so that I got more consistent color throughout the blanket, throughout the throw. But yeah, I'm very happy it is done and I am planning another one, which I will, um, yeah, I'm gonna show you now. I just, it's across the room. So I'm gonna go and run and get it. I actually haven't cast it on yet. Um, I, I got into the last like three days, I finished everything, everything. So my new cast ons are quite little, but I'm happy to talk to, talk to you about them. Whoops, there goes my needle. So just to give you an idea, this is pretty much, the, this is the first 10 skeins. I'm making a yellow one. 
And I'm doing a bunch of, you know, a lot of these are, there's some partial skeins in here, um, some full skeins, speckle, solid, um, you know, kind of running the gambit from like this more citrusy yellow to gold and, um, you know, even like some plain yellow. This is so old. <laughs> this is really old. <laughs> But it's a partial skein. This goes back. This is older than I've had this yarn longer than I've had a skein winder. That's that's what that's a, that is. Um, because it's a ball, not a yeah. And I'm also throwing in some. I have some single ply um partial skein that I used. I don't even know what I used it for, but this is going in there. So it's gonna kind of be goldy yellow ish i have a lot of a lot more um single skeins of yellow than i thought i did so um so that's cool <laughs> I'm, I'm excited about that the, i was looking at all of those skeins like all laid out um and i was realizing that all of them except maybe one or two were mystery skeins that i got either as club colors so i didn't know what i was getting or I just bought like mystery de-stashes or, you know, clearance yarn, mystery colors from different yarn dyers. I don't know what, there's a lesson in there. I, you know, what is it? <laughs> don't do mystery skeins. <laughs> I haven't done any mystery skeins or club colors in years. Um, yeah, just don't want to don't want to do that anymore okay so that is that project oh so i had one other project on the needle that i ended up uh frogging and i'll return back to it some other time but i wanted to show you that clip i wanted to just talk to you a little bit about this project this you i introduced this last week um so if you're new here and you didn't see it this is a start of the weekender by andrea maori and i'm knitting it out of some hand spun yarn that's really beautiful and soft it's a poorth fin sheep blend um, that i blended in the skein as i as i spun um, so you could see how it's knitting up it's really beautiful i ran into a problem though this yarn is not enough to make this sweater. I need to use this yarn for a sweater that doesn't have as much positive ease. This sweater has about 10 inches of positive ease. That's the way the pattern's written. And I'm knitting about a, you know, about eight to nine inches of positive ease, and it's just not gonna be enough. I can tell I'm almost done with my first skein. I have two skeins left and I'm only this far. So this is about six inches um, and it's not gonna make it. Like I think I have enough yarn to do the whole body, but no sleeves. And I don't really, I don't really want to wear a sweater like that with no sleeve, like a sleeve. I don't know. It's just not my thing. Um, also, I think I like the way the yarn knits. I think I like the way it looks on the right, on the wrong side for this sweater. But this would be like. This sweater is meant to be worn with the reverse stockinette side shown. I think I like the way the knit, the yarn knits on the on the front side, on the facing, what is normally the face side of stockinette. I think it looks prettier. <laughs> so I'm gonna frog this project. And this is just a mismatch between yarn and project. And yeah, just how it goes. But I am having a little bit of a panic because I am going, not really, but you know, just like, oh my gosh, what do I work on? I don't have any mindless projects aside from the massive blanket that I'm making. And I'm going away this weekend. So I wanna have a mindless knit so I could sit and be social and watch films or whatever without having to concentrate too much on my knit. So I did a, had a little look to try to find a match between 
my desire and my need for mindless and um, yarn. <laughs> and I think what I'm gonna do is cast on a rainbow hoodie for my granddaughter, Julie. This is also hand spun yarn. Um, if you've been around a while, you'll know that I already made, um, I had four skeins of this yarn. This is what I have left. Was it four? Three skeins. Three skeins, I think, of this yarn. No, it was four. Sorry. Sorry for the back and forth on that. Um, yeah, I had four skeins of this yarn and I knit a, a rainbow hoodie using um, Max Sears. Maxim Sears um, mini unbearable sweater. So this is this is the pattern, a printout of the pattern. So it has like a little, it's a hoodie like this, um, no pocket though, with um, a, a, what is it called? Color work bear and flower motif down here at the bottom, which I'm not gonna do. I didn't do it on the first rainbow hoodie. But so I made this for my granddaughter. She is two and she outgrew the one I made. And I told her parents that I had enough yarn to make the next size up if she, uh, once she outgrew that. And I'm gonna go ahead and make it. They were telling me that she lo loves to wear that sweater all the time, even though it's too small on her. So I'm gonna go ahead and do this. I think this is a good um, match between yarn pattern and desire. So. Um, the one struggle I'm going to have or, you know, work I need to do is that the way that the pattern is sized, he just wrote one, two, three, four, but this is a two-year-old. This is a, this is for a six-year-old, then it's 12 and size uh, a 16-year-old. So I, and, and I think he did that because there's the color work here and he probably had constraints around the color work. Since I'm not doing that, I'm going to try to split the difference between size one and two to get a size four for her because I don't want to make a size six. That's, you know, it'll be a long while before she'll be able to wear it and she loves it now. So, all right, so that is my plan. Frog Weekender cast on hoodie, rainbow hoodie. This will be fun. I, I, I loved knitting the other one. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and, and uh, get that started today. I, I hope you understood. That really wasn't going to work out, and it was just, I was setting myself up for frustration. But I did make a really lovely little rainbow hoodie for my granddaughter, Julie. It is finished. This was a very quick knit. It took me about a week to make. And what you're looking at, this is, if, you're, if you've been here a while, you'll know that I already made one of these. I already made a hoodie for Julie. She outgrew it. And it's her favorite sweater. It was her favorite sweater. So her parents had to hide it from her to keep her from asking to wear it. And um, I told her I'd make her a new one. So I have now made her, the first one was probably like a size two. This is about a size four. So this should fit her this year and next year. I do have a little extra yarn. Um, actually, you can see it sitting right here. So if necessary, I could make it longer. So if she needs it to be longer, um, that there's definitely that possibility. The yarn is my own hand spun. I made from an advent that I got in um, 2021. So I spun this yarn at the end of 2021 into 2022. The advent is from Green Goat Ranch. It was from her. It was an eight day countdown calendar. I think she calls them countdowns, not advents. And she does them all the time. So she she'll do like a countdown, you know, in the summer and and you can buy it and open it whenever you want. Um, I happened to buy this one to save it and I saved it until Christmas time and opened it um, in, you know, I took, I did it like eight different, every like two, three or four days I opened a, a batch and I started to spin it right away. Um, but as I started to see the colors and the way that the colors were coming out, I spun them in the order in which I received them. So starting here at the shoulder, this red with hot pink, was the first day, then the orange with the yellow, then green, then blue, then purple, then teal, then this like squash green color, and then um, this color here, this red with orange in it. So I, that was the order in which I received them, um, in which I opened them, and the way that Sarah had numbered them. 
And after I opened like the second or third bag, I realized that I understood what I was getting, how, and that I was getting it in rain, kind of like a rainbow order, or like it's not a true rainbow order, but it's like rainbow esque order. And I decided that I was going to make four skeins of yarn. They were going to be two ply, so I was going to make eight bobbins with, and they were just, I was just going to spin in order. So I began with eight bobbins, all starting with red. Then I attached the orange and then I attached the green and so on and so on until I had spun each of the eight bobbins had all um, eight colors two three four five six seven eight yeah all eight colors on the bobbin and then I plied them so I had four I ended up finished with four um, skeins and I think I ended up with about 1200 yards or so maybe a thousand yards something like that it's probably closer to a thousand, I would imagine. And the weight of the yarn ended up being about a sport weight to DK. Um, it is 100% Rambouillet and it wears really well. Um, so yeah, it was a really fun. It was it was a it was a fun spin. It was fun to see, really fun seeing it knit up because you as soon as I finished it, I caked them and you could see the way the yarn would naturally self stripe. Um, so I have like what I ended up with here is uh, part of you know the beginning of one and then the end of another um, or actually these are probably the same because I ended up needing to um, I needed the green to finish the hood and then I wanted the green to start on one of the sleeves so that's why I ended up doing it that way um, yeah, and there is there is a drawstring. I need to weave that end in um, right there. But there is a drawstring that I just skipped because when I made the other one, I did put a drawstring in, and the either Julie or her parents, my son and daughter-in-law, pulled it out, like took it out. I guess it was just too troublesome. So this one, I just didn't make it. I just did the trim without um, doing uh, the drawstring. But yeah, that is. A brand new sweater for Julie. She is in Texas right now visiting friends and family. So um, she'll be home soon and hopefully I'll get to go up and see her. Um, hopefully ahead of moving. I don't know, since I don't know when I'm moving, I guess that's highly likely that I'll be able to go see her before I move. Oh so yeah, that was fun. So what does that make? Four finished objects, yay! <laughs> It's so funny to me, like I usually do not, I'm not a person who has nothing on the needles, but I got very close to having nothing on my needles. Um, I did a lot of like kind of shifting, twisting, turning, trying to figure out what to knit. And I ended up making a handful of swatches um, to just kind of figure out what I would like. I swatched for the Sheep Camp, is that what it's called? Sheep Camp Sweater by um, this one. And I won't have to put a picture on screen. By Jennifer Berg. Purchased the pattern and swatched for it. This is some um, Charcoal um, Brooklyn General. Thought I had the tag, yeah, Shelter. Cast Iron is the color. And this is worsted weight the pattern calls for DK but I found it worked okay um, my gauge is actually pretty spot-on <laughs> considering I am a little bit looser knitter but that shouldn't have made sense that wouldn't have made sense um, but yeah this is the this is what I, I used I will be casting this on but I didn't cast it on quite yet um, the contrast color that you're seeing there is more hand spun I called it Bunny Rainbow. It is an Angora Merino blend that I blended on the wheel. And it ended up coming out to be a sport weight yarn. But again, when I swatched it, I was really dubious actually about it even working. Cause this worsted weight with sports weight, what the heck am I doing? It's supposed to be DK. Maybe that's why my gauge worked, I don't know. But you can see it really filled in nicely. I think that fluffy, that fluffiness just like poofed and filled in where it needed to. So 
I thought I, I went and looked through some of my other yarns and I was like, I have so many other yarns that I could use for this contrast color, but I think this is going to be it. Um, I originally, when I originally made this and then purchased the shelter, I purchased the shelter to go with this and I was planning to make a bouquet sweater by Junko Okamoto and I don't know, I just like had this sheep camp sweater in my head and I'd seen a few people who had made it and I just decided this is what I actually want to make. <laughs> and what do I have on hand? Because I don't want to buy yarn. And I realized I had this and I was like, when am I making that bouquet sweater? Why don't I cast that on? What the heck is wrong with me? <laughs> and just decided that this was, you know, a good, um, a good pattern for that yarn. And if I decide down the road to make the bouquet sweater, I'll buy yarn for it. Spring is springing. Spring is springing around here. There are flower, I mean, there's not a lot of flowers yet. We have a little crocus, some snowdrops, but the trees are getting ready and it is going to suck because I have allergies. I'm really allergic to trees, um, especially oak, and there's a lot of oak around here. I was really hoping to be moved by the time that happened, but no such luck. It's about to happen. Um, and maybe next time I film, I'll have some clips of some daffodils and tulips and stuff because those should be coming up in the next couple weeks. I'm sure they're probably up nearby because um, there's some early ones. We have late, we have mid and late blooming daffodils. Um, but yeah, I also swatched for the Samuel Cardigan by uh, Hohi Locatelli using more black, more black yarn. Um, using this um, yarn from Wooly Mammoth. I'm going to show you. I've actually knit a little bit of this sweater, so I'll show you it in a minute. I bought this. You you may remember I bought it last year, a limited edition um, from Wooly Mammoth Company, and she's in Northern Ireland. It's a Heberton Black Welsh Mountain Black Welsh Mountain yarn a four ply, so it's 50% Heberton, 50% Black Welsh Mountain. I was watching, I love her blog, her vlogs so much. They are definitely worth a watch if you're not already watching them. Um, she, she has a YouTube channel and she does like weekly vlogs. She was knitting a sweater using this yarn and I was like, oh, I have that. And it made me wanna go get it. I think it's gonna be like, go get it and swatch it. I think this is going to be hard wearing and really delightful to um, to wear. I think I'm going to reach for it all the time. So the Samuel sweater, I'm working on the short rows, so this isn't there isn't a lot to see here, but I'm going to show you what I can. The Samuel sweater is a cardigan with um, cables that go right down on either side of the button band. And I've never made a sweater with short rows that create the drop that becomes your front neck before. So this was a first for me, um, but cool, interesting. This is not a new Hohe pattern. It's been out for a while. Um, I think it's been out since 2018 or 2017, something like that. But there you go, that's what I've got done. Um, I'm still doing the short row shaping. I haven't quite made it to the first twist of cable. I think I'm about seven or eight rows away from that part. After I swatched though, I really hemmed and hawed quite a bit about like, maybe I should pick a different yarn for this sweater um, because black and cables and all that texture, it's gonna be hard to see, but I, you know what? Black texture is a thing. <laughs> so <laughs> mixing black textures, that's a thing. I was like, screw it. I want this sweater in this yarn and I'm just gonna do it because it just looks, it looks so nice. And I, I know when I was holding it up, you could see, you see a lot of light through it. It's funny, I guess, yeah, you do see. That is the nature, I think, of the um, pattern. I think, because I hit gauge like, no problem with this yarn and um, with the same needle size that the pattern called for. It's meant to be like this sort of lightweight wool 
um, textured cardigan. So she made the pattern, the original was made out of tuka wool. So no surprise that a four ply, another four, four ply would work just as well. Um, a four ply toothy wool, like wooly wool, non superwash wool. Um, so yeah, I really love it. I love the way it's coming out. It is definitely um, a pattern that is more engaging than just a very simple knit. And um, as you know, I like to have an engaging knit and a simple knit. And that is why, because this is so engaging, that is why I have um, held off on casting this sweater on. Also, shelter is worsted. It's gonna be a heavier weight sweater. We're moving into you know spring and early summer where lightweight knits are more I'm more likely to wear. So I um, yeah, I just decided to uh, focus on this and to you know maybe cast this on later in you know this spring like May or so or June, maybe after I move. I'm hoping to get that blanket done before I move because I just don't want to have to move all that yarn. And um, yeah, it would be good. Would be good. So this has been very fun. Um, I literally cast it on last night. So I, I'm working away. I'm like um, getting pretty, you know, moving moving through the short rows pretty well. And um, yeah, we'll see. It's nice to have an engaging knit, but it is also nice to have a mindless knit. So on Thursday, I cast on, because I finished Julie's sweater, I cast on this beauty, which is really spring-like, but also fuzzy. Um, my, yeah, I'm kind of in the middle of a round, um, but I am making the, uh, another, yet another daily pullover. I think this might be my fourth one. Cause I made, I made one in linen quill. I know I, I made a linen one. I made a, I made one in linen quill, which I love, hate. I love it, but I hate it. It's, <laughs> I hate that yarn. I'm just gonna say it. I don't like that yarn. I know it has many fans out there. I do not like it. Um, it's got very, it's a lot of alpaca. So it has, a, um, short fibers which means it pills like crazy when i wear it i love it it looks shabby it looks like i've owned it forever i've i haven't even owned it a year and um it just drops pills everywhere so i'll find like little black fuzzies all over my apartment um from wearing it just they just fall off so yeah <laughs> realness that's what you get here realness <laughs> Yeah, I just don't, I'm not a fan of that yarn. Pattern I love though, um, which is why I'm making yet another one. So there's not a lot to see here in terms of the pattern and it's why Martha's not here because there was nothing for her to wear other than a couple inches of fabric and I can just hold it up. So um, I actually purchased this yarn last year, last year or the year before, Partly I think I purchased in fall of 2021 and then I bought the Kumo. This is um, La Bina May. Cause what's beautiful about this sweater is the yarn. <laughs> I could have made any old thing with this yarn um, and it would still look great. Um, but I am making, I'm holding two strands together of La Bina May Helix in the colorway Wisteria and a uh, Kumo in the colorway wisteria. So I'm holding two of one of each, both wisteria. This is a gray base. This um, helix is a gray base, which is why it's reading darker. But I just thought these are so beautiful. These are like, you know, these are kind of the colors that you want to reach for in the spring, right? Like these pastel pretty sort of Easter egg colors. So I thought this would be, you know, a nice knit. And when I purchased the Helix, I think I bought it at one of those free shipping sales. Um, so it was pretty new. I didn't know what I was gonna do with it. And then I realized that I needed to hold it together with something else. So I waited for another sale and then ended up buying the Kumo in the same color to hold with it. Um, so the Helix is 75% Falkland Merino and 25% Gotland Wool. Kumo is an alpaca Surrey blend, so a Surrey, baby Surrey, and mulberry silk. So 
So this is going to be the coziest sweater. I'll be able to wear it next to skin if I want, um, or with like maybe a tank top underneath. It'll make a great layering piece for, I mean, the springs here in the Northeast where I live are pretty chilly. It's spring is kind of a deceptive season because you look out and it looks so beautiful. But when you walk outside, you're wondering where your down coat is because it's so freaking cold. <laughs> um, so it'll continue to be in the 40s Fahrenheit pretty much. Um, sometimes it'll get it up around 55 or 60 for like an hour and then the temperature drops again. Um, so, cause we always have chilly nights. Like we pretty much always have cool nights. It's unusual even in the summer for us to have warm nights. I mean, there's a handful of weeks where we have warm nights, but generally speaking, the nights, nighttime, it cools down around here. So yeah, this will be great for this time of year. Um, if I get it done in the next couple weeks, but this is my, um, my mindless knit. However, I am still forming the V-neck. The Daily Pullover has a V-neck. Um, so I am still forming the V-neck. So until I get through that, it won't really be totally mindless because I do, I am doing something almost every round um, as I am kind of like building the V of um, that, that sweater. So that is, those are my two whips. I just have two. Um, well, I have more, but they're they're sleeping. They've been hibernating for quite a while and I don't feel like, <laughs> I don't feel like pulling them out. One of them, I'm gonna frog. So I, maybe I'll film that for next time because I was thinking about frogging it this week. Um, one is, two are designs that I've made that I haven't finished. Um, because I'm not inspired to finish them, but I might, maybe after I move some, I might get a shift, a change, you know, transformation. And I might feel like it. Also, I do want to talk about, I did talk uh, two episodes ago about a new design that I wore to Vogue Knitting Live. And I am planning to publish that pattern this year. Um, I, I, ha I just don't have the bandwidth to finish the pattern up. Like I need to... Uh, do a little tweaking with the shaping of the v-neck because I didn't quite get it right. So I, I need to do that and then I need to just finish grading it. It's mostly there. I just need to finish that and I don't think I'm going to, I've just decided to table it. I'm not going to try to push myself to do it now um, when I have a million things about this new place and, you know, the mortgage and blah, 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 all this other like moving house stuff going on in my head. And I don't have anyone to share that with. Like, I don't have a partner who can shoulder some of that so that I can, you know, do other things. I'm by myself. So it's, it is what it is, but it's just, you know, I have to make choices that are sometimes ones that I don't want to make. And so my plan now for that sweater is to get it so that it is, available for purchase probably like August or so. Um, and it'll go out for preview testing, preview knitting and, and so, so-called test knitting um, probably in June. That's my, my thought on that. So I know there's a couple of you who have reached out to me and who have shared that you are interested in um, in doing some knitting, testing the, the pattern for me. And uh, thank you so much. I deeply appreciate it. It's really hard to find testers. So yeah, that is basically all of my knitting. I have been doing a little bit of spinning. I finished the spin that I, I was a finisher this week. This is still a little damp. Um, but I finished the skein that I started um, last episode. I showed you one bobbin. So I didn't really, it's loosely um skeined up because it's still damp but yeah this is starry nights by ingle nook fibers this was their 12 day countdown um i did a two ply fractal spin um what each day there were two consecutive days across 12 days so like 12 divided by six like two mini bats or batlings that were pretty close color wise so i divided those in half so like two light blue took those two green took separated those two turquoise separated those two navy separated those two purple separated those two olive separated those they weren't exactly 
perfect. But um, I then made each set of six a bobbin. One bobbin, I took the batlings, the little batlings, and I divided them in half. So I did, and then I went light to dark, light to dark. And then the other one I divided into four. So light to dark, light to dark, light to dark, light to dark. So it's, because fractal is two to one, one to two, two to one, whatever your ratios end up being. And what that does is it creates a yarn that is blendy, but also sort of stripey. Um, so you end up with a lot of um, color variation as you knit it, kind of like Spin Cycle, like what Spin Cycle does, if that makes sense, or like Zabber Balls do, if you're familiar with those. So yeah, it has a little bit of sparkle. It's really pretty. I don't know what I'm going to do with it. It's a lot of yardage, a lot of yardage. Um, it ended up being about a five ounce skein, which I knew um that it would be a big fat skein but and it's probably why it's still damp but it was yeah it was cool i have another spin planned that is more of sarah's rambouillet yarn so like the rainbow the brights rainbow this year from sarah i purchased um let me see if I can take some of these out i purchased what she called beach rainbow countdown um so you may have already seen some of this in um in my vlogmases um but yeah so all of them kind of have like a sand color in them like sort of this taupey sand color like so that's pretty consistent so I'm going to try to do something along the lines of what I did for Julie's sweater. Um, and maybe this will end up being my weekender sweater. Um, I'll see that really see how it comes out. So I'm going to, I'll film the process of me figuring out <laughs> how to spend this and how to lay out the colors. Cause a lot of the colors are kind of similar. It's not a true rainbow. Um, but I'm going to see, I'm going to look at the, you know, think about Roy G. Biv and lay it out and just see what I get. And uh, yeah, I'm going to figure out how many skeins I can make by um, applying color on color. So this won't be a fractal. This will be a self-striping color on color um, mix. And yeah, we'll see what happens. Also, just to circle back, this is more of a spinning thing than a rain, you know, than rainbow sweater thing, even though it's really pretty. This particular skein that I used to knit the body, when I did color on color, I just happened to choose two bobbins where the length of red and the length of orange and the length of green, et cetera, et cetera, were a pretty close match. There was just a very short period, like a very short stretch of yarn, like um, less than a yard, about a half yard, where the colors marled where they blended and you know applied color on color um that's why you're seeing such really crisp lines so to compare that to here this skein there wasn't as close a match so i had a really long stretch of several yards where it was the blue layering with the green so here i didn't have that but here i did and the same thing happened um in this section here this orange section where you can see it's sort of like peas and carrots because it went from green to, from orange to green so that was another like that was from the same skein that this this green was so it just is a matter of luck really um because uh, even though i weighed i weighed out the fleece so as i was dividing it i would go okay here's my red let me divide it by eight it is you know say it's 20 ounces i'm gonna do you know four bobbins then five ounces per, or five grams like let's do 20 grams because 20 ounces is a crazy amount of wool that would be more than a sweater's quantity for me um 10 ounces if you're wondering is about a sweater's quantity for me I can get away with eight if I do a thin, a very thin <laughs> fingering weight, light fingering weight. Um, but 10 is solid. I know I can get a sweater out of 10, 10 ounces. Um, so say if you have 20 grams and you want to do four bobbins, you would 
put five grams of red on each bobbin and then you do the same with your green if you've got 18 grams and you divide by four and you know so y you do your best with the weight and that but that's not a guarantee that you're going to spin because you're not a machine that you're going to spin the exact same yardage um of each out of each five gram set so um you know, I don't mind the the marling that happens as the colors change. Like you can kind of see it here between the purple and the teal, and those few rows there. I don't mind that, so I'm fine with that. And I actually think that this spin, this beach rainbow spin, will be a little more marly, um, just because it's there's that consistent brown, taupey sand color going through them. You know what's really cool about these two, which I didn't realize when I when I bought it? She named each colorway for a particular beach. So this one's Capri. And this one's Marseille. I I don't know if she's visited <laughs> all of them, which would be really fun and cool. Um to you know, that she was inspired by those particular like I don't know how she I mean there's a thousand million beaches around so I don't know how she chose those particular beaches but anyway um I have one more segment for you I have my exploring woolly myths segment I recorded the entire woolly myth yesterday when I did the rest of the video good morning it's Sunday morning um and while the video was processing for me to post um, and I went to bed while I was laying in bed I was thinking that I really didn't do a good job I was a little too um, wishy-washy on my answer so I want to address the woolly myths a little bit cleaner and concise more concisely today and then yeah so that's why you're getting this like cut <laughs> with a new me it's another day. Um, I'm wearing a vintage college sweater from one of my son's college. My oldest son went to Bowdoin College, so that's what I'm wearing. Um, okay, so the question, just going to do the whole segment. The question is from my friend Roz from across the pond in the UK. Hi, Roz. She writes, hi, Shannon. <laughs> I would love to know how bad superwash yarn really is for the environment. I really enjoy knitting with it, but would like to know if I need to start buying non-superwash more consciously. That's her question. So, if you're not familiar, superwash is a treatment that is done to wool. Um, in the treatment process, it strips away the outer core of the fiber shaft and then they coat it lightly with a, a plastic based um, chemical. It requires a lot of water um, and a lot of uh, a lot of wastewater that ends up you know needs to be filtered and cleaned before it could be returned um, to the environment. Um, so yeah, it's got a lot of, it's, there's a lot of chemical processes. I would say the answer to that question is yes. I think it's, I think we all should be more conscious about what we buy, but not just yarn, everything. Um, I think plastics generally are ruining this planet. <laughs> like there's so much ruining this planet, but plastics really are ruining it. Uh, and you know, the clothing and textile industry is pretty bad. Um, they, they're all about the money. They chase the money. They don't worry too much about the consequences, as we've seen repeatedly in some of the, you know, repeated offenses of that industry. But superwash yarn um, is not, I would say, as bad <laughs> as man-made fibers can be. Um, and that's simply because, like, it's very hard to quantify. I should I should have started this whole thing by saying it's just super hard to qu quantify the impact, the environmental impact of each and everything because it's so nebulous. And, you know, in some ways, 
things could be doing some good like there are certainly places where plastics do some good um but uh if i had to i was thinking about this if i had to rank fibers in terms of you know good to to not so good i would put natural fibers at the top because they break down readily um just based purely on the way they break down some people would take cotton off that list because cotton uses a lot of water to be to grow um some people would replace linen with bamboo um, because bamboo is a sustainable you know crop um some people would maybe say wool isn't as good because of the impact of um, sheep on the planet but sheep have been around a long time thousands and thousands of years and we haven't had our planet in trouble until recently when chemicals and things like that suddenly modern ways of living have um, started to impact it so I would definitely put man-made fibers which did not emerge until the mid century mid 20th century as the worst um and of those nylon is probably nylon and rayon rayon is based on is a linen based product so i know this is a lot more <laughs> than what Roz asked but i think i would be neglectful if i didn't bring up all of this um yeah polyester is and acrylics are probably the worst i would say so nylon isn't so bad because it does break down within a lifetime where polyester and 30 years it takes about 30 years for nylon to break down polyester and acrylic will especially polyester last forever so i wouldn't buy polyester anything i don't buy polyester anything unless it's somehow in a blend that I like up for like this couch I think ha might have a little bit of man-made fiber in it in the fabric um so yeah it's important to be a conscious consumer I think if you care about the environment and you want you know to to lessen the your impact um I would buy non-superwash first and superwash second and all the man-made fibers last um the the thing with superwash so some you'll find a lot of info on the internet about superwash yarn about about the the pros and cons of it um it is washable so i mean it's machine washable i should say because wool is washable um and wool sweaters are washable as we know because we soak them at the end um, in water so yeah but if you know maybe your lifestyle you're raising little kids or something and your lifestyle just isn't conducive to soaking all your hand nets and you buy superwash because that makes your life a little easier I think that's okay I mean it's a temporary thing I mean I, I wanted to just share too what Clara Parks says about superwash just if this helps you um, understand you know the or see the fuller picture besides the simple answer I gave at you know a few minutes ago um Clara Park says it's important not to demonize to to not demonize superwash because superwash helped re-energize the wool industry so the wool industry was losing out to all of the man-made um fibers and people were losing interest because they had other options of clothing to wear um superwash has been around a lot longer than we think as knitters i mean if you if you're a long time knitter like i am superwash emerged maybe about 15 years ago but superwash the superwash process has been around for longer um anytime you see a wool garment in the store and it, you'd probably most likely see this in athletic stores if it says it's made of wool 
or it likes smart wool socks for example i love smart wool socks i have a ton of them they're a super wash because anything anytime wool is washable that's a super wash so super wash has been around in the garment industry for much longer than it has been in the yarn industry in our in our hand knitting yarn industry um, and what the game changer, just to give you a little history, was that the, a company established a superwash facility here in the United States, and that made it a little more conducive for um, spinners, for commercial spinners, to get the fiber superwashed. Um, and they found a market with indie dyers and other yarn companies. So that's that's the history there, um, but. Yeah, so Clara Park says that that has it had had re-energized, like superwash processes had re-energized the, a dying industry. Um, so I don't think she called it dying, but a neglected industry. So it in that way, it's it is it is important. Um, but I think this is that your question pretty much highlights the struggle we all have in our daily lives of trying to do the right thing, and um, it's hard. It's hard to know. It's hard to um, feel like you're making a difference. But um, I think if you go in with your eyes wide open with what you're doing, that's the most any of us can hope for. And we really need the industry to step up, all the industries to step up, the chemical industry especially, and figure out a way to re-engineer plastics so that they're not harmful. I do want to share just one last thing about Superwash. I shared uh, a couple years ago, about a year ago, a very big moth problem that I had, and I've it's gone. I've beaten the moths, but the moths were not discerning between Superwash and non-Superwash, and that tells me that Superwash are not that bad for the environment if the moths would just go ahead and gobble it up the way they were gobbling up non-Superwash. Um, where they won't touch man-made at all or plant matter at all so um yeah so take take all of that i hope that was helpful Roz and everyone else um and uh yeah i'm gonna return you back to past me talking about it and i welcome comments and even if you don't agree uh, you know, look, we all have different perspectives. And like I said, I'm here to inform. I'm not trying to tell you what to do. Um, so please, like, do what is best for you. Like, if you love the superwash or superwash just makes more sense for you in your life, then gosh, that's fine. You do it. Um, use it. It's better than other alternatives. <laughs> Um, but hopefully it helped. I'm happy to, you know, talk more about it down below in the comments if you have comments about that or anything I talked about. I love reading your comments. Please comment below and like and subscribe if you want. If you don't, that's fine too. And I will see you again soon. Bye.